One goal in communicating any musical idea is to have a common, written language that describes specific pitch pattern information. Consider this your first lesson in music fundamentals as we begin this process with an agreement on the naming of the different pitches. Listen to a few different scales played on the piano. Watch for the pattern that emerges. Observe that each scale begins on a specific pitch. Within each scale, we find that there are seven different pitches. The eighth pitch is always a higher repetition of the starting pitch, and the same seven different tones are repeated, although in a different order, in each of the scales. So let's begin by looking at how names were given to these seven different pitches. Many years ago, musicians used the following names for the seven different pitches. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, and Ti. The names worked well enough to communicate the idea of seven different pitches, and the names could be used to discuss those pitches as long as Do, Re, Mi, etc. represented the same pitches to all the musicians involved. But the names weren't capable of communicating specific pitch. Thus, when played by any musical ensemble using different starting pitches, one would get Somewhere along the historical line, musicians came to understand that specific pitch consisted of a unique frequency of vibration. At some point, a frequency was chosen and given the name of A in accordance with the first letter of the alphabet. The remaining six pitches were likewise named, and today we refer to the seven different pitches as A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So today, if we tell a musician to play an A, that musician will play a tone that all of us will recognize as some form of the same pitch. Now the challenge becomes, how can I write something that will tell a musician that I want them to play a specific low, middle, high, or very high, A, B, C, D, E, F, or G? For picturing the highness or lowness of a pitch, or range of pitches, it is generally agreed that the piano keyboard serves as the best visual aid. We will find all sorts of low and high A, B, C, D, E, Fs, and Gs at regularly spaced positions all over the keyboard. We will need some kind of agreed-upon vocabulary or system of graphic symbols that will convey exactly which pitches will be performed. Our current graphic used to convey pitch information is called a staff. As we can see, the staff is made up of five lines and four spaces between those lines. Each line or space is named for one of the seven different tones, either A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. But in order to express the exact or specific pitch, either a high, low, or middle sounding A, B, C, D, E, F, or G, we will need another graphic symbol called a clef to communicate the exact range of the pitches. When we change the clef, which gives us a certain range of pitches, we will automatically adjust or change the names of the lines and spaces so that the tones represented by them will fall within the range associated with that particular clef. There are three clefs that are commonly used today. The first clef that we'll look at is called the G or treble clef. 
It's called the G-clef because the symbol itself is a form of the letter G and seems to surround and indicate the staff line that we have named G. It's called the treble clef because the word treble means high-pitched, which tells us that the range of tones on this staff are not low, not middle, but are within the higher sounding range of tones. In this example, we have used a modern form of the letter G to indicate the clef symbol. In reality, the clef symbol used today is a highly ornate form of the letter G. Today, the G, or treble clef, appears as this symbol. We can see that it is still a G, but has been dressed up quite a bit. The lines of the staff in the treble clef, from the bottom to the top, are named E, G, B, D, and F. From the bottom to the top, each line represents the name of a specific tome. One way of remembering the names of the staff lines in the treble clef is to use the phrase, Every good boy does fine. From the bottom to the top line, each tone sounds like The spaces between the lines of the staff in the treble clef, from bottom to the top, are named F, A, C, and E. For memory's sake, they conveniently spell the word face, and like the lines, each space represents a specific tone. The tones from the lowest to the highest spaced sound like Another commonly used clef is the F or bass clef. It's called the F clef because the symbol is a form of the letter F and seems to surround and indicate the staff line that we have named F. It's called the bass clef because the range of tones indicated on this staff are lower in pitch. Like the symbol for the treble clef, the symbol for the bass clef is still the letter F, but today it appears in this more ornate form. The lines of the staff in the bass clef, from the bottom to the top, are named G, B, D, F, and A. Again, each line representing the name of a specific tone. One way of remembering the names of the staff lines in the bass clef is to use the phrase, Great Big Dogs Fight Animals. From the bottom line to the top line, each tone sounds like The spaces between the lines of the staff and the bass clef, from the bottom to the top, are named A, C, E, and G. One way to remember the names of the spaces in the bass clef is to use the phrase, All cars eat gas. The tones represented by these spaces, from the lowest to the highest, sound like Sometimes, when reading a piece of music, you will see short, evenly spaced, horizontal lines either above or below the five lines and four spaces of either staff. These are called ledger lines. Notice the extensive use of ledger lines in this excerpt from Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune. Ledger lines merely serve to extend and continue in order the names of the lines and spaces of the staff graphic. For example, looking at the top line in the treble clef, we can see that the space created between the top staff line, F, and the first ledger line above it is named G. The name of the actual first ledger line above the G is A. Examining all the ledger lines shown demonstrates that the A through G sequence is repeated over and over again.
returning to the statement that it is generally agreed that the piano keyboard is best suited for visualizing the highness or lowness of a pitch we can go a bit further and say that when used in conjunction with the bass and treble clefs the piano keyboard is best suited for visualizing the specific pitch indicated by the line or space on the staff for example we find one of the tones named c very near the center of the piano keyboard this C has its own specific frequency and, therefore, sounds different from any of the other higher or lower Cs. Because this C is situated near the center of the keyboard, we call it middle C. Observe in the illustration that there is an overlap of the notes occurring between the treble and bass clef staves. The C's written on the ledger lines both above the bass clef staff and below the treble clef staff are situated in the same position at the center between the two staves. These overlapping notes represent the same tones and are identical in sound. The sounds that both written middle C's make is the keyboard's middle C. Thus visually, the C ledger line, situated in the middle between the bass and treble clef, can be associated with the C in the middle of the piano keyboard. Now that we've established middle C as a kind of visual and auditory reference tone, we can name the specific pitches above and below middle C according to their relative positions above and below it. In addition, an alphanumeric name given to middle C is C4, as there are three other Cs below it on the piano keyboard. For example, in naming the E just above middle C, we actually say E above middle C or E4. The following are the tones as they look and sound within the range of the octave just above middle C. In naming the E one octave higher than that, we say E one octave above middle C, or E5. The following are the tones as they look and sound within the range of one octave above middle C. If we want to describe the E an octave higher still, we would tell the musician to play an E two octaves above middle C, or E6. Following are the tones as they look and sound within the range of two octaves above middle C. Likewise, in naming the F, for example, just below our middle C, we refer to it as the F below middle C, or F3. These are the tones within the range of the octave just below middle C. Naming the F an octave below that, we say F one octave below middle C, or F2. These are the tones within the range of one octave below middle C. If we want to describe the F one octave lower still, we tell our musicians to play the F two octaves below middle C, or F1. These are the tones within the range of two octaves below middle C.
This idea of using middle C as a kind of reference point brings us to the development of another clef symbol, that is, the C or alto clef. This clef symbol appears very much like the letter B, but in reality it is meant to represent a very ornate letter C. The alto clef gives us a range of tones that fall midway between the bass and treble clefs. On orchestral scores, the primary instrument using the alto clef is the viola, although a few other instruments, like the trombone, the English horn, and the bassoon, use it occasionally when playing in their higher ranges. The alto clef is used primarily for music that would normally be written extensively with ledger lines above the bass clef or below the treble clef. In the alto clef, the symbol seems to surround and indicate the center line of the staff, which represents middle C. The staff lines of the alto clef are named from bottom to top F, A, C, E, and G. The tones represented by these lines, from the bottom to the top line, sound like the spaces within the staff having an alto clef are named from bottom to top, G, B, D, and F. The tones represented by the spaces from the bottom to the top space sound like G, B, D, Musicians using the alto clef usually employ their own individual memory aids for reading. This concludes your first lesson on the basic communication of pitch information. The next few lessons will introduce you to the communication of tempo, rhythm, and duration of tone.